Welcome to day two of Rillet, uh, and welcome to uh, Flex Learning. Uh, I'm Jen Danbert. I'm the Director of Instruction with Wild Rose School Division. Uh, we're based at a Rocky Mountain House, um, Drayton Valley. Um, we stretch up to Breton and down to Caroline, and as of this year, out west to Norday, because uh, we've reopened our school out there, which is exciting to reopen a school in a rural community instead of just having the opposite conversation, which we often do. Uh, and I'm here to share about blended learning, online learning, um, how a technology, how pedagogy and change can come together uh, to look at giving our students some different options. As I share today, um, feel free to tweet. Um, I'm a heavy Twitter user, so I'm at Jay Danberg on Twitter. There's a lot of E's there. Uh, and if you'd like to follow along in the presentation, there's lots of links and things. Um, it is bit.ly slash rural ed, all lowercase. Feel free to follow along on the Google Slides. Feel free to make a copy. Feel free to ask questions there. Uh, and I have my email address at the end, so feel free to uh, give me a shout with any questions. Uh, as we go through today, uh, Donna Wesley was kind enough to give me a 90-minute session. Uh, so if you have questions, I have a very bright light in my eyes, so you might have to give me a little bit of a shout, but don't worry about pausing and asking a question. And uh, if you have a question, we have a, a, a nice group to uh, be able to share and be able to talk things through. And like I said, I have 90 whole minutes and about 60 minutes here. So if there are questions, uh, I'll leave lots of time at the end, but uh, don't feel afraid to stop and ask as well. So when we... Uh, look at online learning uh, and I'm a lot focused on what we're doing in high school right now um, but part of this is sharing what we did last year I actually presented on this last year uh, and one of the requests that came after the session was share with us how it's going in the second year so it's going to be a little bit of repeat from last year in terms of what is the overall picture but there's going to be a lot of what's how is this going in year two and how is this changing and how is this shifting given current considerations, given budget pieces, and all those other things. So, let's dive right in. So, blended learning. Blended learning is a term. Uh, there's lots of terms out there. But when I look at blended learning and the philosophy that my team has taken, is we look at student control over four things. Student control over time, place, path, and pace. So it's not just any time, anywhere, any place but there's this pace to the learning that students also have control over. Uh, and this is really important because it can meet the needs of accelerated learners, it can meet the needs of those that take a little bit longer. It, it's more than just the vision of inspiring education, it's a very student-centered approach that builds in these four components. Now the four components of time, place, path, and pace um, actually come out of the work of Horn, who I don't agree with everything he says because he has a lot of philosophies around um, teacher role and, and how many students a teacher can handle, but uh, his research on blended learning is really quite interesting. A and he talks a lot about connected modalities uh, for an integrated learning experience and connecting across and giving students a lot of agency and a lot of control in what they're doing. So what does this actually look like? Now I want to share with you Carter. Now Carter is a student uh, who took his first online course with us last year. And he was a grade 12 student last year. He's, uh, he's in university now. A and he started his first online course on May 27th. And he graduated at the end of June. So he decided to take this on right at the end of his schooling experience. Uh, and he, his last project um, was reflecting on his online learning experience and what he's learned. And uh, a lot of the kids just would type something up or make a slideshow. But Carter made a video. Uh, and it was completely his own choice of how he presented his learning. And he just sat and he talked and reflected. And it's seven minutes, so I want to warn you of that now. But it is so powerful and so honest. And it's not all good. Uh, but he is very honest and very open. Uh, and he's given permission to share this. And he's quite embarrassed that I'm sharing this. But, uh, uh, and I'm sure Darren will recognize this young man as he hangs out with his son. So this is Carter. Uh, he's uh, from Rocky Mountain House. So a moment that I make this full screen. Sorry.
Matt Carter. He is, he was our valedictorian. I won't, I won't pull any punches there. All right, we'll get this back to full screen for you. He, he's, he's an excellent student. Uh, but his honest reflection had me thinking a lot. Um, when he said, I have near 24 hour access to my teacher, well, that was me. And that was true. Uh, this, and when, when he said things like, my assignment just seems to disappear and comes back marked, also true. You know, I, I, it's a different world when your students aren't necessarily always in front of you because you, they can hand in work and you can talk to them anytime, but you, could also, you, you also don't have them right there in front of you. So it definitely has its limitations, it definitely has its advantages, and I think Carter put them best. It's, it's a different world, it's really interesting. It, it allows us to work together in ways that we couldn't before, but it's not fundamentally changing teaching, and it's not fundamentally changing the fact that we need teachers and we need classrooms. We just need to look at giving students a lot of choice and a lot of different pathways in their learning. That's what we're trying to do. What does it not look like? Uh, and I'm gonna channel my inner Phil McRae here. Uh, it, it doesn't look like kids sitting in front of a computer with headphones on. Uh, and I am really struggling with this in, in a few ways. I, I'm seeing classes full of kids doing exactly the same thing, doing the exact, exact same tutor, the exact same website where they're running through a set of very low level skills. Instead of using technology for a way to find new information, and, and, and find a way to be creative, find a way to share, find a way to work together. One of the things that I have been working really hard to get rid of in my own district is a program called Fast for Word. And I got it out of two schools this year, so I'm really quite happy with that. And it, it's a program to teach reading or to supplement reading when the kids are below, according to the company. Um, and it's supposed to work on all these things, but it only really works on fluency. Uh, and it's the idea that if I put headphones on and look at a screen, I can get better at reading. It is quite disturbing to me in a lot of ways. Uh, and Phil McRae from the ATA has done a lot of research on this. Um, the top link is to his article uh, where he talks about the hype, harm, and hope of what blended learning could be. Uh, and and he's, he's very honest. Uh, and he talks a lot about that he's really, really worried about a whole bunch of kids in a computer lab, and when he says a whole bunch of kids, he's talking hundreds of kids, um, with a TA or not a qualified teacher where the computer is doing that instruction. And that's what we want to avoid. We want really high quality teachers using technology when it's the right tool uh, to access learning, to share learning, to collaborate and work together. And in an online space, we have to be really careful of that, that we're not just using it to substitute we're not using it to augment teacher numbers. Um, we would never want to do that. We want to just find different ways of accessing kids at different times. Uh, so very aware of, uh, of Mr. McRae's work and trying very hard to not go down that path. Um, I wrote a follow-up paper to his work. So the second one is called the WRSD Context. And, and it shares where we're not doing well and it shares where we are doing well. Uh, and some of the things that we're working on to change. So. It's good to be self-reflective in your own district on how you're using technology and how this plays into instruction and what's going well and what's not going well. Uh, so, so some honest reflection from WRC there, if you'd like to read it, uh, it is linked for you. I won't make you read it, don't worry. So that leads us into the Flex Learning Program. Now, I was tasked with this uh, almost two years ago now. Uh, I was hired into Wild Rose and given a project, and it was a really fun project. And they said, so we want to do more online with kids, we want to do more options at high school, we want to look at high school redesign pieces, we want to look at inspiring ed pieces, we want to look at the ministerial order, and we want to see if we can provide more options, more time, um, more different ways of looking at programming. So, and I, I'm going to channel a little bit of Michael Fullen here, uh, and his work in Stratosphere. And we were really looking at integrating technology, pedagogy, and change knowledge, and, and how that can be fundamentally liberating to our teachers and our students. Uh, we're working at democratizing learning so every student learns how to learn for a lifetime of pursuing personal passion, purpose, and fulfillment. No big lofty goals there at all. Students are to learn collaboratively, consolidating connections with others locally and from afar. Citizenship, human solidarity, collective problem solving, 
and sustainability are thereby served. So that's a direct quote from Fulham, but something that we keep working at and how we can bring technology, pedagogy, and change together. So Flex Learning is a group of teachers. Last year we were seven, and we had six people that were half-time in the regular classroom. When I say regular classroom, we're expanding what that means rapidly. Uh, and half-time working in an online blended environment. So they were embedded in schools. We didn't set up a separate online school. We didn't set up any separate place they had to be. Our teachers were in our other high schools. And that was really, really important to us because we wanted accessible local teachers. And I'll tell you a little bit more how, about that, how that shifted to year two. But when we look at why we're a little bit different, we're using those four components of blend ed, that time, place, path, and pace, to have more opportunity for our students. There's a lot of great programs out there. There's a lot of great material out there. We are not the first people that have ever gone down this road by any sense. But we're trying to look at it in terms of student-centered. We're trying not to make it tool-centered. And we're trying to look at what it means from a local context. Uh, we're not trying to recreate and redo everything. We access a lot of ADLC in our programs, and they complement us very, very well. And, and we're trying to look at where those needs aren't being served and where we can meet needs locally and complement the things that are already out there. So that's working really well for us. Not to replace, but complement. And, and complement other online distance programs and complement our regular programs, which is really important. And so some of the things and the features that we aim for and strive for and what we're not. We're not asynchronous, we're not synchronous, we're a little bit of both. We're synchronous when we need to be, we're asynchronous by design. Now what the heck does that mean? We don't have scheduled classes, we are not, they don't go to their online course Tuesday at 2 o'clock. Uh, they have access to their teacher when they need their teacher. They don't have access to their teacher via VC, but they have access to their teacher via video any time. So that's hard. And when I say any time, it can be in a boat on the North Saskatchewan somewhere near Drayton Valley on a Saturday afternoon. I've actually taken that call. Her name was Jessica and she was quite shocked to see me in a boat. But I answered her question. <laughs> and so we don't have scheduled webinars. Uh, we, we, we struggle with the webinar model. We see it as a large substitution of the regular classroom. We don't see it as moving up the SAMR model. We don't see it as changing anything. Um, if you just have a teacher in a virtual classroom, that's not any different than a teacher in a classroom in a lot of ways. There's not a lot of functional change or there's just a little bit of functional improvement in terms of students can be in different places. We don't see that as a modification or redesign of what technology can bring and what change can bring to help students learn in a different path or a different pace. It might help a different place, but it's not going to help a different time. So we don't go with that webinar model of uh, English 30-1 is every Tuesday and Thursday at 2 o'clock. Too limiting for us. Uh, we don't use traditional VC software, the polycoms of the world. Um, that is too equipment heavy for us. That ties you to a place, that ties you to booking the VC suite every Tuesday at 3 o'clock. And that was really, really hard for us. And the technology is not great anymore. It was a really great technology in 2001. It's 2016. Uh, we use Google Hangouts extensively, whether that's a video chat, whether that's a text chat, and that's my student has a question, they dial me when they need to dial me, and either I say, hey, I'm not available till 1 o'clock because I'm in a classroom, or I take their two-minute call and I answer that question right there. So it isn't a big hour-and-a-half model of um, a floating head. It's a teacher popping on, saying hello, and answering your question when you need it. And that's working really, really well for us. Now, our teachers have embedded time for this. So whether it's a .25, whether it's a .5, um, I actually get to teach in this too, even though I'm a director at Central Office. I teach about point four in this program, and that's been so much fun. A and help me help the teachers that are also teaching in this manner. Um, gives me a little bit of credibility. And it gets, because I was new to the district, I got to know a lot of the teachers and students this way. We provide materials so that students can learn as they need it. I have a javelin thrower he here, and he's, uh, he's the recent World Cup champion in javelin. 
He was a sprinter from Kenya, and he couldn't make the sprinting team. So he watched YouTube videos and he taught himself the javelin from YouTube. He eventually did get an actual human coach when he needed it, when it was time that he needed it. And he went on to win the world championships in javelin, which says a lot. He used the resources on the internet to teach him to, te to learn a skill, to realize he was good at that skill. And then he asked for teacher support and got that teacher support for a coach when he needed it to get to that next level. And that says a lot about what we're trying to do. The students can access materials and use some self-paced things, but then when they need a teacher, there's a teacher there. And that doesn't mean a teacher at 2 o'clock in room 32. It means a teacher that can be down the hall, a teacher that you can ping on the internet, or a teacher that's just in the town down the road. I, I had a student come up to me in a grocery store and say, do you actually live in Rocky Mountain House? Because <laughs> I'm, I'm a floating head to them in a lot of ways, or I'm just a little uh, avatar in a chat box. So I was like, well, yes. And they're like, oh, you seem so far away. <laughs> and I've actually had a student, as I walked down a hallway in a high school, go, hey, you, I know you, you're my teacher. Uh, so it's, it's a really different way of looking at being a teacher, especially I, I come out of an elementary background. Uh, so I was a grade five and six teacher and a kindergarten teacher for years. And now suddenly I'm a high school computer science info pro and mechanics teacher. Mechanics online, we'll get there. The way we see it, our courses need to be irresistibly engaging. I love that term. They need to be elegantly efficient and easy to use. They need to be technologically ubiquitous, accessible 24-7, and steeped in real-life problem solving. And again, I'm borrowing from Poland there. So a lot of models have pieces of those. I'm not saying we're there in everything, but we're getting there. Uh, and we're using a lot of the feedback from students like Carter to help us get there. So I, I mentioned the SAMR model. Uh, this guides the way we use our technology. Um, we can look at the bottom level as technology doing the exact same thing, substitution. It's, I was writing on a piece of paper, now I'm typing in a Word doc, I'm typing in a Google doc. It's not doing that much different. When we look at augmentation, we're starting to move up that stack. We're using these tools with things like grammar check and spell check, things that piece of paper couldn't do. It's just a functional improvement. I could have still done those tasks in other ways. It might be faster, it might be more efficient. Carter spoke to a lot of that. When you start to move up in the SAMR model, you start to move up into the modification. And this is when it gets interesting. Notice the color has changed. Modification is fun. Modification is doing things in a really different way. All of a sudden, you're working on that document together with somebody else. They might even be from a different place. And you're getting feedback really quickly from a teacher. And that is significant redesign on the way that students operate and the way that learning can happen. And Carter was starting to even get excited about that. Redefinition is hard in any sense of the word to really get to that top level of something that wasn't even able to do before. And I hit this when I was actually working on my MED. And I went and I taught in Scotland for two years. And my group work was still in Lethbridge. So I was working for the U of L. And I had people in my group from Onaway. I had people in my group from, oh, Peace Property School Division, way up north. And I had people in my group from Lethbridge. And I was in Scotland. And we were meeting together. And the only limitation was time zones and when I was awake. It was, we could work away on our dock at the same time. We could easily pull into a video chat. And we could work away, and, and it didn't matter, other than quite literally where the sun in the world was, where we were. Uh, and, and that is pretty previously inconceivable in the world of education. So we're trying to pull some of these things in, and we're trying to move up the stack. Not everything we do is up the stack. I like to say we get to augmentation all the time. I like to say we get to modification most of the time. And when we're really good, we hit that redefinition. Uh, working on it. So, some of our other features, and I used the slide last year, but they're, they're really important. Uh, the first picture there with the flower uh, is meant to represent a learning management system. A learning management system is a place where all your courses go to live and your students go to one place and every course looks the same and it's all about making sure that the students know where they're supposed to be. And we don't do that. We don't have a common LMS. We don't have one place that students go for courses. We have about six or seven. And we, we try and model it after the regular classroom. 
Every classroom that students go into is a little bit different. They hand in work in a little bit different way. Their teacher might teach them in a little bit different way. They might access materials in a different place. That's okay. It shouldn't have to be all the same online either. Every course is a little bit different. Every teacher is different. Every tool is a little bit different, and they have different uses for different things. Uh, we love Google Classroom. We love Schoology. We love Weebly. We love Strikingly. We love Tack. We love Padlet. We use all sorts of tools, and what it does is it builds a digital fluency across tools. As students don't just use one tool, but they gain a breadth of knowledge across tools, so it's about the skill. It's not about the specific tool knowledge. We will have students going off to all sorts of different post-secondary places. They might be using D2L, they might be using Moodle, they might be using a wiki, they, oh, they better not be using a wiki. Move on if you're using a wiki. Very 2019-98. But we, we want to make sure a couple of things held true. We wanted to make sure they could access their learning on a mobile phone. This was especially important in our rural context, as that is often their main connection to the world, especially outside of the school. Uh, when they get home, they often have data. They might not have a high-speed internet connection, or they might have a slightly flaky high-speed internet connection, or they might have an internet connection that lasts them about the first two weeks of every month, and then they run out of data. Uh, and this happened with Emma. Emma's a student near Alder Flats, and I couldn't figure out why she was only handing me in work for the first two weeks of every month. Uh, and that's because her brother would use up too much data playing online games. Uh, so she, she apologized when she finished her comm course. She said, I, I could get work done and then I was just out of data. So we make it so it's accessible on mobile phones. It doesn't mean that that's the only tool. Um, but they can see their course content and do work on their phone because that is a main connected tool for kids. Uh, and we wanted to make sure it was accessible there. A lot of existing big name LMSs don't work very well in a mobile environment. Google Classroom does, Weebly does, uh, TAC does. Um, we give our students a lot of choice in how they hand in work. Uh, you get a lot of, we get a lot of video, we get a lot of docs, we get a lot of slideshows, we get posters, we get pieces of paper. That's okay. Uh, we also build our courses so they have multimedia but they have options. We try and keep them not data heavy but well designed because we don't want to exhaust our students' dat data plans in, in a rural context. Um, so we make things with plain white backgrounds, but that still look quite nice. So they, we don't have heavy graphic backgrounds. We have videos in a lot of things, but there's text options around videos if that doesn't work for them. We make of things, so a lot of them are printable. We give them multimodalities. So they can print it off, they can do it in other ways, depending on their situation, depending on their, how their connection is at home. So we're very aware of the rural context and how that might look for our students. But we're also very aware that the students need those digital skills. So we don't shy away from them, we don't back away from them, we embrace them but give options. And that's hard for some students and hard for a lot of teachers. So where are we at? Year one, I stood up here about a year ago and said, hey, we just launched a month ago, we're great. <laughs> and uh, there was a lot of, yeah, sure, talk to us in a year. And that's very fair. Uh, so year one, um, I had six teachers, uh, six half-time teachers, and the first semester, so from September to January, they had that half-time to develop and plan and work together. And they all had every afternoon um, unscheduled in their timetable so that they could collaborate, they could work together, they could build courses. We did a lot of planning, we spun a lot of tires, we did a lot of redesign, we did a lot of things badly, we did a lot of things well. And we launched in February of last year with four core courses and 12 CTS. We're currently up to 12 core courses and 63 CTS. So we've grown. And we've grown through partnerships. We've grown through being able to work with other people. Um, and we've grown because we, we had to dig into the teaching of it all. Um, a year ago, we were only a month in. And we've, I'm going to pose four problematic areas to you in a little bit. And a lot of those were things we learned right away. Uh, we had a lot of questions around assessment. We had a lot of questions around timing. We had a lot of questions around convincing schools and teachers that we weren't infringing on their territory and that we were just trying to do things in a different way. And we had to learn how to be online teachers because none of us had ever done that before. 
uh, and that was a really fun learning curve. A and the best thing about the six teachers I got was they were six of the best teachers. Uh, and that was hard for some of the schools to give away some of their really, really strong teachers. But I, I, I got to sit and work and grow six of our best high school teachers. Uh, and when I say high school teachers, three of us were actually came out of an elementary background um, and moved into this high school world because we wanted to see education in a different way. So that was really fun uh, to have those high school teachers and those elementary teachers working together and to really stretch people in a lots of different ways. So year two, we had a shift in the way we held our team. Uh, we had six halftime people that had every afternoon. We had block time. Uh, and that became a high school scheduling nightmare. Uh, I had principals crying at me, quite literally, um, trying to make timetables work. Um, we now have 10. We don't have, we didn't change our FTE. Uh, we still have three FTE plus whatever I end up contributing. So we actually have, in a school division of 5,000 students, we have three FTE that are dedicated to this program. And they're teachers, they're teaching students. Uh, so it's just a different use of FTE, it's not extra FTE. Uh, so we have 10 teachers now. We make sure we have one in every school. We have seven high schools. And when I say seven high schools, that includes two outreaches. That includes two or one K to 12 school. That includes some rural schools where the high school has 60 kids. Um, two big high schools. Uh, and we have one at every school. Um, and we really have enjoyed having our teachers embedded in the outreach especially. That's been absolutely huge because we've seen this as huge growth in our outreach schools. We've seen it as looking at a lot more local courses, looking at a lot more hands-on courses, which I know I said online and blended learning, but I'm gonna share some of the ways we've been doing this hands-on. One of our biggest struggles has been around financing and money. I know that's a huge shock. Um, it was hard to watch Minister Egan share that he was funding enrollment growth and that there were so many more teachers hired when I work in Rocky Mountain House and our student numbers are dropping by the day. Uh, as, as our energy industry is in such trouble. And that means our money is going down. And yes, you may have funded growth, but with our rural areas, we are not to keep them growing. In fact, we're getting smaller. And that means less budget, less money, and more ways of looking at that as an opportunity to do different things. But it was hard to watch that. But it was the audience was rural ed saying, yes, we're funding growth. And what if they're not growing? So what if they're not growing? How can you see this as, as something to work on and something that you can look at together? Uh, this last year we moved all our high schools, not our religious, but our high schools to the high school like that funding model. That's been really hard for the flex learning program because in a lot of ways we were producing extra credits or producing things in a way that they weren't being done before. And, and we locked in our funding and that's been a little bit hard for us. Uh, so we're being creative. Uh, we're looking at ways, we don't want to replace What's going on in our high school? Our high school is doing great things. We want to supplement, we want to add, we want to give them choice and options. And some of that choice and option requires funding. So we're using our outreaches uh, to the best that we can um, and, and giving a lot of choice to them because they're not on a lot of funding models. Um, and we have a lot of students that attend both schools, and that is the best thing that we can do for those kids. Give them options, give them different educational experiences, some in a traditional high school, some in an outreach. That's really, really positive for students to experience lots of different ways of learning. Our courses are a work in progress. They keep getting better. They keep changing. And that's really, really fun. Um, my 10 teachers, some of them are at 0.25, some of them are at 0.5, some of them are somewhere in between that. We, had, we found right away it was hard to develop courses and it was hard to teach at the same time because you spent all your time being a teacher and you didn't necessarily develop. So, um, one thing we learned right away in year two here is that we had to divide. So I have a teacher in Caroline who's just developing at this point in time. I have a teacher up at Pragmatic and she's just teaching at this point in time. So we tried to find that balance of not having teachers doing too many different things, whether they were just developing or just teaching, and that was an important distinction for them to help them figure out what they were doing. One of the struggles has been how they fit into their school. Um, so goals of the program. I have three big goals. And when I say I am the team. My first goal is that every student in our school division completes an online course. 
God has said it's in the Christ case. This is really, really important to us. Uh, we're not there yet. We want to do this because whether you go into industry, whether you go into a cosmetology career, whether you go into post secondary, you're going to have online training at some point in your life. Whether it's a women's course, whether it's a safety course, whether it's just uh, uh, an online course at your university, you're going to run into these schools in your lifetime. Whether it's your driver's test. Learning online is something that is going away, and we need to help students learn in this environment. We need to help students be able to function in this environment and have the digital fluency to get there. So if you're not offering any of these courses and the students aren't getting them through other places, because there's a lot of options for kids to get online courses, they should be somewhere. Uh, and it helps our teachers to understand where kids are going to be learning as they see beyond our walls. Uh, so it's important for teachers to get used to these kind of ideas. Uh, and how can we build teacher capacity to use some of these non traditional pedagogies? And some different tools and push them. Um, my most innovative user is the technology of my own teachers. My most resistant to some of my ideas. Some of them are just taking it and working with it and enjoying it. So I'm really trying to push uh, how they're using tools. And, and it's more than just to do some research and type in it. So how can we use the tools differently? How can we bring that pedagogy, change the technology together? And my other big goal, and one of the things that was so nice after I presented last year, was sharing and expanding beyond all girls. Uh, and that happens a lot, not just sharing it at real life last year. I mean, a lot of people come up and say, hey, we're doing this, what if we work together? Uh, and I've had wonderful partnerships. Um, some of the people that I've been lucky to work with have been working a lot with the Black Gold School Commission. Um, they are wonderful thinkers. I've been working a lot with Terry Reid and Jennifer Sarkoon there. Um, they develop courses, we offer them, we, they, we develop courses, we give them to them. We work back and forth in about a month. We have kids coming from the outreach in the Duke to Drake Valley, and they're going to be doing a free credits of mechanics. We're quite literally we're lining up cars down Main Street in Drake, and we're taking oil, we're taking tires, and we're washing cars. And it's all about mechanics courses, and it's all about actually doing these things. That our kids are great, they're going to go to the Duke. And they're doing it uh, some forensics, and it's a locally developed forensics course, and they're doing different types of things that are some hands on forensic work there. So it's, it's been really fun to work with us. I've been talking a lot with Sturgeon School Division, been uh, working with Peace Program, and I had a student from Peace Program hand me a piece of work the other day. And I'm going to write about this. They're going to have to hand me a piece of work the other day. Uh, they, wanted, they, they knew I had developed the course and they wanted me to go through it first before they handed it into their teacher and be delivered, uh, which was pretty fun. Uh, and that's where I started my course, which I'll share with you. Uh, we've been working with the Palos or Beyond Border School, um, and to keep the Palos there. Uh, so lots of connections and friends there. We've been working with the Canadian Marshals, sharing things across. Um, got the text. I was there in Marshall and Thursday Friday last week and show them a little bit more about what we're doing. And we've been reaching out a lot with Rachel Public. Rachel Public is using a couple of our pushes. We've been working a lot with Core Plan um, and the Core Two stuff there. Uh, so we would love to keep working with more people. Cool. One of the ways that uh, we collaborate with them a lot, um, when I start with my teachers, they're like, okay, but how do we get PD for this kind of teaching and learning? And the message is a lot, so we created it. And it was it, a really big struggle to find, should we go to ATO? How, how do we get together with other teachers teaching in this way? Uh, and it wasn't a great place to do it, so we created our own. Uh, and I worked with Terry Reed, and I worked with Eric Foster, I worked with Lauren Keaton, I worked with ALC people, who are our, uh, and, and we put together, and uh, other people, um, so we were also really great in this. And we put together a conference called Blend Band, and we had our first one last year. Uh, we had 300 teachers come to Edmonton, and we had Valerie Irvin, who's a professor at the University of Victoria, come and work with us. We had Kathy Kavanaugh come and work with us. Um, we had Stone Craig come and work with us. And it was a really, really strong three days of looking at online and blended pedagogy. So we did it Please join us. It's getting those teachers that are trying to do things differently and have a different mindset and putting them all in the room for three days and watching the brain snizzle. It's so much fun. Uh, we were in Edmonton uh, next fall, October 23rd and 25th, and uh, it's a really great teacher-led conference. Uh, this year, we were looking at one of the first ones, 
Have you said yes yet? Keep uh, watching. Keep going. And uh, we're looking at uh, expanding down and adding more to your brain and mental people. Um, and we uh, have a few people that we'd like to join us on that. So, mm-hmm. now I'm just high school, but it's another one of our goals. One of the biggest things that allows us to operate, that allows us to run, that allows us to move forward is having the activity. Um, I, I work with one of the big IT departments in the province. Um, I, knew, I know two years ago you guys heard a lot about the shared services model and how school divisions in rural areas are working together uh, to increase connectivity across school divisions and to share expertise and this is a huge benefit with you on the program with others. So we, we have super strong internet. The kids can bring in any tool. They can, there's no passwords. They can bring in free tools. They can use for free tools. Which means that regular classes can be running and if they have a spare or they're in their flex block, it doesn't matter where the school they are. They don't have to worry about having a weak connection. It just works. And it's wonderful. They can stay after school. They can play basketball games and hand their work. Uh, I have students that sit on the first steps of the school to do their work, and that's okay. It does present the challenge that we're in a rural area and we're trying to have connectivity everywhere. Um, our county school is coming up, which I talk about again. But uh, I know that there are a lot of counties that have a rural communications project that is really exciting and I'm hoping to expand. Uh, and one of those pushes is because education is changing and they're looking at how can we access and how can we connect our communities. And uh, how can we give up to the band aid that Ken Coates gave us two nights ago and said, make your world centers an innovation, innovation hub? Uh, and this is one of the ways to try to do it. And we're working with our local partners in our county to try and get that connectivity to every home, not just in our school buildings. Uh, the supernet is wonderful and fantastic, but that's not the only place we learn. So we get that connectivity everywhere. Expectation of learners. All right, we have trained our kids very well this year. Listen. And then I get them on all my course and say, here, I don't know, go for it, try it. You ask your question again, you ask your question. And then I put one of my kids, the other kids, the other stuff. And so I have spent a lot of time freeing kids up, freeing teachers up. And it's once those doors open, it's really hard to close them. Uh, I use a tool called Springcast if I can't tell it's better video. So it's going to be a, hey, I'm not sure how to use this you take a charge, I'm not going to tell one moment anymore, that is it. So I'll make them a quick two minute video, I'll send it off, and they're like, oh, I've got it, okay, thank you. And it's me walking into my office, which people think I'm crazy as a lot of hours and shows, and walking into my work. And I think how to do this when I send them a quick video on YouTube. My YouTube channel now has over 700 videos, and I've made these for students. And, and it's so much fun. Uh, when they start to ask their other teachers, hey, can you just make a video of us? And maybe other teachers like me know what to do. And so I can teach the other teachers how to do that. How to get there just in time to what they need to get past that thing that's bothering them and take them to the next level. It's always all learning and it requires that connectivity, but it requires, it requires that enthusiasm for the teacher to be able to do that. This is really I'm going to be at least three times a day. When I say ping, it's on video on Google Slash. Um, I'm sort of more sitting there because I have to stop in the last four minutes. Uh, and these are just in February 24th. And it's, hey, did you get that screen? Did you, just, did you get it? Did you get my work? Can you, can you do this? Can you send me that link to you? I don't what to do with this. And it's just, oh, oh I just need a quick, I, I put my piece in there. I, I'm sure she sent out her lessons. <laughs> That's not good. And you should be real nice. But this is really hard on my stuff. I'm going to worry about that. Uh, but uh, it, it's, it's that I can't teach them right now. I'm going to get that feedback. Or the, hey, I'm actually driving home from Britain right now. I can't fix the drive. Give me an hour. She's like, okay. Uh, so it, it's really fun to be able to connect with kids like this. And, and, and I use me up there, but my other teachers live in this world too. Uh, it's really great for building relationships. And that's been one of the key cornerstones to the expectations of learners is they're used to that relationship with the teacher in front So when you're in a different kind of world, that relationship remains that important, but that relationship shifts to a world that they're actually more comfortable in in a lot of ways. And some kids are very comfortable in this world. And they like the fact that they can talk to me in, in a different kind of way. And they like the fact that they can make a quick video and, and send that out there and get some feedback on it because I'm meeting them where they're at. Does it work for 
I wish she was really well for some. I want to share with you Ethan. Ethan is a little more special needs. He's kind of in the mild, moderate category, but not severe. Uh, he's in high school. He likes to play video games. He struggles to write. He struggles to get his thoughts out. Except that he does. And he is the rest this is Mr. Galloway. And uh, knowing how Mr. Galloway operates, he's going to make a good use of his receiver. Okay, so the first time I did this, it didn't upload properly, and now I can't find the video. So I'm just doing it again so that I can that I'll resend it to you. So the first question. This is for Module Nine, Lesson Two. The first question: Public versus private. Uh, how do Google tools allow you to be both public and private with your work? Public, unlisted, and private videos on YouTube are so by making YouTube videos public, private, and unlisted that can decide who gets to see your videos and stuff like that. So you can make it so that only certain people can look at your stuff. How can online learning tools support learning? Um, well, with online learning, you can communicate and ask questions to your teachers after school on weekends. So uh, you can uh, email your teacher saying, like, when do we have any tests coming up? Do I need it? What do I need to study for? And stuff like that. And uh, so, yeah, that's like asking questions to your teachers, like, even after school or on weekends and stuff. Um, and next question, what are your favorite Google, Google tools or features? I like using Screencastify because I can make videos really easy. Because, like, for stuff like this game here, like, there's this event, and, like, if you put, in it, if you put like, an equipment item, a helmet or something in here, there's a chance that it'll upgrade. And so, but, but by clicking on certain places on this button for different levels, it increases the chance of it successfully upgrading. And so I had figured out, like, for level 1, level 2, level 3, level 4, like, where you got to click on the button in order for it to have a better chance. But then, once I shared that with everyone, like, all these people, they didn't understand how it worked. And so I had made a video explaining how I did that. How I did that. So that's how that's what I like using Screencastify for because it's much better than explaining it in here because it's it's pain in the butt. <laughs> but do teachers need to know about Google Cloud and online working? That if it's done right, it can make your life a whole lot easier. But if done wrong, it can be very very confusing. Very confusing if you do it wrong. Yeah, um, copyright is hard to deal with online. How can Google help? Well, by using the insert image button, like searching for anything on here, like nothing has copyright on it. So you can use any of these pictures and you can't get hit with copyright on it because they're already cleared for copyright. And that's all the questions. Yay! Seizures! No. Okay. So I used Google Docs and Screencastify as the two programs to use for this assignment. Yeah.
Okay, so I don't actually really have a question. I just want to quickly jump in and say something um, from my perspective. I'm, I listened in from an employment and a uh, management perspective, and this is almost word for word our work environment. This it was really exciting uh, to hear that because um, this is exactly how we work. This is our, how our whole company is structured. Um, we use Google Drive for everything. Um, we, with our developers, we don't care when they come to work. We don't care when they're around as long as the work is done. Um, some of them are night owls, so we let them be night owls. Some of them um, work best from the coffee shop, so hey, let's have them work from the coffee shop. Um, we have a team from across the province, or across the country. Um, we touch base via webinar, via Google Drive all the time. It's our whole environment. Um, so to hear that this type of thing is being really stressed and talked about is really exciting from an employment perspective, because when we hire, um, this, this kind of stuff is one of the main things we're looking for. Um, our, our, man, our interview process is centered around um, collaboration. It's centered around um, you know, working as a remote team. It's centered around uh, your cultural fit. And all of this is really huge for that. Um, also, like the, that SAMR model that you described, that's the creative process. Um, any, um, like in our industry, design process, um, design, graphic design, web development, software development, app development, anything related to that field, that SAMR model that you're trying to replicate with this learning method is exactly the uh, creative process. It's, ex it's exactly the design process, um, that collaboration, refinement, and all that kind of stuff. I could talk for days about this, but it, it is really exciting to hear. From my perspective, I'm not an educator, but um, I encourage you guys to chase that, keep going, because that's like in our, in our work environment, in our industry, that's exactly the kind of stuff we do, and that's exactly what we're looking for. So it's definitely, that's awesome. It's on the right track. <laughs> Um, one of the questions, that I'm from uh, Kenmore Collegiate, one of the, the struggles that we have is uh, getting First Nation students um, to, you know, bums in seats in classrooms. And I'm wondering, you would mentioned a little bit about um, CALM and KE, uh, a KE version of that. And I'm wondering what the hurdles or the, the potentials might be around, because I, I like the idea of um, cell phone, text base, because lots of our students do have um, at least text access um, to phones and I'm wondering what uh, potentials there might be that you might see because that's a way to be able to get students connected.
Hi, Jen. Thanks so much. Great presentation. I really love the way you balance the pragmatic and practice with the theory and the research. So excellent. Uh, and thanks for all the vivid examples. I'm just wondering, um, with respect to the teachers, were they did, did they put their hands up or were they asked to be a part of this? Okay. And then just to follow up, because I'm going to let you go, tell me about the pr principal's role, because I'm just I'm also channeling uh, my ATA colleagues and thinking workload. And, how do you ensure that teachers are supported and have space time in order to provide this kind of incredible access that is really, as you showed, integral to student learning? Yeah. I'd like to see you guys 
So I guess my next question is, if our students access your courses, who, who do they send their um, assignments to? To your teachers, or do we have to set up our teachers to do that? <laughs> Yeah, and there's not much point in recreating everything when it's done, but you need the compensation for it. Yes. And in some of our small schools, we wouldn't have possibly a teacher that could have those assignments. So if we could work out some kind of uh, reciprocal agreement where you, where they, where you were their teacher somehow, I think that'd be great. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, I, 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 I,